The first broadcasting of a radio transmission consisted of Morse code or wireless telegraphy was made from a temporary station set up by Guglielmo Marconi in 1895. This followed on from pioneering work in the field by Alessandro Volta, André-Marie Ampère, Georg Ohm, James Clerk Maxwell and Heinrich Hertz. The broadcasting of music and talk via radio started experimentally around 1905–1906, and commercially around 1920–1923. VHF very high frequency stations started 30 to 35 years later. In the early days, radio stations broadcast on the long wave, medium wave and short wave bands and later on VHF very high frequency and UHF ultra high frequency. However, in the United Kingdom, Hungary, France and some other places, from as early as 1890 there was already a system whereby news, music, live theatre, music hall, fiction readings, religious broadcasts, etc., were available in private homes and other places via the conventional telephone line, with subscribers being supplied with a number of special, personalised headsets. In Britain this system was known as electrophone, and was available as early as 1895 or 1899 sources vary and up until 1926. In Hungary, it was called Telefon Hermundo 1893 1920s, and in France, Teatrophone 1890 The Wikipedia Telefon Hermundo page includes a 1907 program guide which looks remarkably similar to the types of schedules used by many broadcasting stations some 20 or 30 years later. By the 1950s, virtually every country had a broadcasting system, typically one owned and operated by the government. Alternative modes included commercial radio, as in the United States, or a dual system with both state-sponsored and commercial stations, introduced in Australia as early as 1924, with Canada following in 1932. Today, most countries have evolved into a dual system, including the UK. By 1955, practically every family in North America and Western Europe, as well as Japan, had a radio. A dramatic change came in the 1960s with the introduction of small inexpensive portable transistor radio, the greatly expanded ownership and usage. Access became practically universal across the world. <laughs> Early broadcasting Argentina. Argentina was a world pioneer in broadcasting, being the third country in the world to make its first regular broadcasts in 1920, having been the first Spanish-speaking country in Latin America to offer daily radio broadcasts. The main stations were in Buenos Aires and Córdoba. Among the historical facts related to Argentine radio, it can be mentioned that the first radio broadcast was made with the live broadcast of Richard Wagner's opera Parsifal from the Teatro Calicio in Buenos Aires, on August 27, 1920, in charge of the Radio Argentina Society of Enrique Sassini, César Garrico, Miguel Mujica, Luis Romero and Ignacio Gómez, who installed a transmitting device on the roof of the building, for which they are remembered as the crazy people on the roof." In 1921, the transmission of classical music became a daily occurrence. The following year, the assumption of President Marcelo Torquato de Alviar was broadcast live. In September 1923 the famous, "...fight of the century." was issued between Luis Ángel Firpo and Jack Dempsey from the Polo Grounds in New York, and in October of the following year the match between the Argentine and Uruguayan national teams was broadcast. Also at that time the first advertisements, called Reclames, were put on the air. At the end of the decade the radio drama was born. In those years several radio stations arose, Argentina originally Radio Argentina, Culture, Excelsior, Mitre originally South American, Splendid originally Grand Splendid, Belgrano originally National, Prieto originally Broadcasting Critic, Del Pueblo originally Quilmes Broadcasting, America, Antartida originally Phoenix, Municipal, Rivadavia originally Mueblas Diaz, Porteña and Stentor originally Sarmiento. 
The introduction of the loudspeakers substantially modified the listening conditions. The receiving apparatus was gaining an important place in the home, gathering around the family. Meanwhile, the multiplication of the stations generated the first conflicts over the airwaves, which led to the first regulations on emission frequencies at the end of the 20s. Topic: <laughs> Nineteen Eighties. Australia. The history of broadcasting in Australia has been shaped for over a century by the problem of communication across long distances, coupled with a strong base in a wealthy society with a deep taste for oral communications. Australia developed its own system, through its own engineers, manufacturers, retailers, newspapers, entertainment services, and news agencies. The government set up the first radio system, and business interests marginalised the hobbyists and amateurs. The Labour Party was especially interested in radio because it allowed them to bypass the newspapers, which were mostly controlled by the opposition. Both parties agreed on the need for a national system, and in 1932 set up the Australian Broadcasting Commission, as a government agency that was largely separate from political interference. The first commercial broadcasters, originally known as B class stations, were on the air as early as 1925. The number of stations commercial and national remained relatively dormant throughout World War II and in the post-war era. Topic: <laughs> Formative years. Australian radio hams can be traced to the early 1900s. The 1905 Wireless Telegraphy Act whilst acknowledging the existence of wireless telegraphy, brought all broadcasting matters in Australia under the control of the federal government. In 1906, the first official Morse code transmission in Australia was by the Marconi Company between Queenscliff, Victoria and Devonport, Tasmania. <laughs> Experiments with broadcasting music. The first broadcast of music was made during a demonstration on 13 August 1919 by Ernest Fisk later Sir Ernest of AWA, Amalgamated Wireless Australasia. A number of amateurs commenced broadcasting music in 1920 and 1921. Many other amateurs soon followed. 2CM was run by Charles McLaurin who started the station in 1921 with regular Sunday evening broadcasts from the Wentworth Hotel, Sydney. 2CM is often regarded as Australia's first, regular, non-official station. <laughs> Sealed set system it was not until November 1923 when the government finally gave its approval for a number of officially recognized medium wave stations. All stations operated under a unique sealed set system under which each set was sealed to the frequency of one station. Part of the price of the set went to the government via the Postmaster General's Department PMG, with money also going to the broadcaster. Apart from extremely limited advertising, this was the broadcaster's only source of income. From the outset problems with the system came to the fore. Many young people built their own sets, which could receive all the stations. The sealed set system was devised by broadcasting pioneer Ernest Fisk of AWA, Amalgamated Wireless, Australasia. Topic categories In Australia from 1924 as quickly as July 1924, the sealed set system was declared to be unsuccessful and it was replaced by a system of A-class and B-class stations. There were one or two A-class stations in each major market and these were paid for by a listener's license fee imposed on all listeners in the five former sealed set stations became A-class stations, and they were soon joined by stations in other state capitals. From 1929, all A-class stations received all their programs from the one source, the Australian Broadcasting Company which was made up of the following shareholders, Greater Union Theatres a movie theatre chain, Fuller's Theatres a live theatre chain and J. Albert and & Sons music publishers and retailers. A number of B-class stations were also licensed. <laughs> 
These did not receive any government monies and were expected to derive their income from advertising, sponsorship, or other sources. Within a few years B-class stations were being referred to as commercial stations. Amateur broadcasters continued to operate in the long wave and short wave bands. A national service, the Australian Broadcasting Commission, was formed in July 1932, when the Australian Broadcasting Company's contract expired. The corporation took over the assets of all A class stations. It still exists as the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The Australian Broadcasting Co. changed its name to the Commonwealth Broadcasting Company and later the Australian Radio Network. It soon purchased Sydney Commercial Station 2 UW and now has an Australia-wide network of commercial stations. <laughs> Types of programmes As with most countries, most Australian stations originally broadcast music interspersed with such things as talks, coverage of sporting events, church broadcasts, weather, news and time signals of various types. Virtually all stations also had programmes of interest to women, and children's sessions. From the outset, A-class stations' peak hour evening programs often consisted of live broadcasts from various theatres, i.e. dramas, operas, musicals, variety shows, vaudeville, etc. The first dramas especially written for radio were transmitted in the mid-1920s. By the 1930s, the ABC was transmitting a number of British programmes sourced from the BBC, and commercial stations were receiving a number of US programmes, particularly dramas. However, in the 1940s, wartime restrictions made it difficult to access overseas programmes and, therefore, the amount of Australian dramatic material increased. As well as using original ideas and scripts, there were a number of local versions of overseas programmes. Initially, much of the music broadcast in Australia was from live studio concerts. However, the amount of gramophone and piano roll music soon increased dramatically, particularly on commercial stations. In the late 1930s, the number of big production variety shows multiplied significantly, particularly on the two major commercial networks, Macquarie and Major. After World War II the independent Colgate Palmolive Radio Production Unit was formed. It poached most major radio stars from the various stations. Until the 1950s, the popular image of the whole family seated around a set in the living room was the most accepted way of listening to radio. Therefore, most stations had to be all things to all people, and specialized programming was not really thought about at this stage it did not come in until the late 1950s. Because of this, programming on most stations was pretty much the same. <laughs> Early experiments with television as early as 1929, two Melbourne commercial radio stations, 3UZ and 3DB were conducting experimental mechanical television broadcasts, these were conducted in the early hours of the morning, after the stations had officially closed down. In 1934 Dr. Val McDowell at amateur station 4CM Brisbane conducted experiments in electronic television. Mobile stations Two of Australia's most unusual medium wave stations were mobile stations 2XT and 3 Yatta Bytes. They both operated in eras prior to the universal establishment of rural radio stations. 2XT was designed and operated by AWA within the state of New South Wales, from a NSW Railways train, between November 1925 and December 1927. 2XT, which stood for Experimental Train, visited over 100 rural centres. Engineers would set up a transmitting aerial and the station would then begin broadcasting. This led to the further sales of AWA products. Three Yatta Bytes provided a similar service in rural Victoria between October 1931 and November 1935. Initially, the station operated from a Ford car and a Ford truck, but from 17 October 1932 they operated from a converted 1899 former Royal Train carriage. <laughs> 
Whilst the engineers were setting up the station's 50 watt transmitter in the town being visited, salesmen would sign up advertisers for the fortnight that three Yada bytes would broadcast from that region. The station was on the air from 6.00 and 10 p.m. daily, and its 1,000 record library was divided into set four-hour programs, one for each of 14 days. In other words, the music broadcast from each town was identical. The station was operated by Vic Deneni, but named after announcer Jack Young from Ballarat. On 18 January 1936, Deneni set up three Yada Bites Warrnambool, followed on 18 May 1937 by three UL Warrigal. The merchant vessel MV Canimbla is believed to be the world's only ship built with an inbuilt broadcasting station. The Canimbla was constructed in Northern Ireland in 1936 and was primarily designed for McKilraith McEachern Limited to ply passengers between Cairns, Queensland, and Fremantle, Western Australia. The broadcasting station was constructed and operated by AWA and was initially given the ham radio callsign VK9MI but was later 9MI. At this time, the 9 in the callsign was aberrationary see call signs. Above, the station made an experimental broadcast before leaving Northern Ireland, and a number of such broadcasts at sea. On the way to Australia, 9ME's first official broadcast in April 1939 was made from the Great Australian Bight. The station broadcast on short wave, usually a couple of times per week, but many of its programs were relayed to commercial medium wave stations that were also owned by AWA. The 9MI manager and announcer and probably the only member of staff was Eileen Foley. 9MI ceased broadcasting at the commencement of World War II in September 1939. The Canimbla was commissioned as a Royal Navy, later Royal Australian Navy vessel with the name HMS, HMAS Canimbla. It had an extremely prominent and successful wartime career. Topic: <laughs> Canada. The history of broadcasting in Canada begins as early as 1919 with the first experimental broadcast programs in Montreal. Canadians were swept up in the radio craze and built crystal sets to listen to American stations while the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company of Canada offered its first commercially produced radio broadcast receiver model C in 1921, followed by its Marconophone model I in 1923. Main themes in the history include the development of the engineering technology, the construction of stations across the country and the building of networks, the widespread purchase and use of radio and television sets by the general public, debates regarding state versus private ownership of stations, financing of the broadcast's media through the government, license fees, and advertising, the changing content of the programming, the impact of the programming on Canadian identity, the media's influence on shaping audience responses to music, sports and politics, the role of the Quebec government, francophone versus anglophone cultural tastes, the role of other ethnic groups and First Nations, fears of American cultural imperialism via the airwaves, and the impact of the internet and smartphones on traditional broadcasting media, radio signals carried long distances, and a number of American stations could easily be received in parts of Canada. The first Canadian station was CFCF, originally an experimental station from the Marconi Company in Montreal. Civilian use of wireless telegraphy had been forbidden in Canada for the duration of World War I. The Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company of Canada was the only one to retain the right to continue radio experiments for military use. This proved instrumental in giving the company a lead in developing an experimental radio broadcasting station immediately after the war. The first radio broadcast in Canada was accomplished by the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Company of Canada in Montreal on December 1, 1919 under the call sign XWA for experimental wireless apparatus from its Williams Street factory. The station began regular programming on May 20, 1920 and its call letters were changed to CFCF on November 4, 1920. In Toronto, the first radio station was operated by the Toronto Star newspaper. 
Station CKCE began in April 1922, and were so well received that the star pushed forward with its own studios and transmitting facilities, returning to the air as CFCA in late June 1922. In Montreal, another newspaper, La Presse, put its own station, CKAC on the air in late September 1922. Because there were governmental limitations on radio frequencies back then, CKAC and CFCF alternated—one would broadcast one night, and the other would broadcast the night after that. For a time, CKAC was broadcasting some programs in French, and some in English. In 1924, for example, the station rebroadcast 15 Boston Bruins hockey games from station WBZ in Boston. Meanwhile, in other Canadian provinces, 1922 was also the year for their first stations, including CJCE in Vancouver, and CQCA which soon became CHCQ in Calgary. As radio grew in popularity during the mid-1920s, a problem arose – the U.S. stations dominated the airwaves and with a limited number of frequencies available for broadcasters to use, it was the American stations that seemed to get most of them. This was despite an agreement with the U.S. Department of Commerce which supervised broadcasting in the years prior to the Federal Radio Commission that a certain number of frequencies were reserved exclusively for Canadian signals. But if a U.S. station wanted one of those frequencies, the Department of Commerce seemed unwilling to stop it, much to the frustration of Canadian owners who wanted to put stations on the air. The Canadian government and the U.S. government began negotiations in late 1926, in hopes of finding a satisfactory solution. Meanwhile, in 1928, Canada got its first network, operated by the Canadian National Railways. CNR had already made itself known in radio since 1923, thanks in large part to the leadership of CNR's president, Sir Henry Thornton. The company began equipping its trains with radio receivers, and allowed passengers to hear radio stations from Canada and the U.S. In 1924, CN began building its own stations, and by 1928, it was able to create a network. In 1932, the Canadian Radio Broadcasting Commission was formed, and in 1936, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the country's national radio service, made its debut. Cuba There was interest in radio almost from broadcasting's earliest days. Due to the proximity of Cuba to the U.S. state of Florida, some Cubans would try to listen to the American stations whose signals reached the island. But there was no radio station in Cuba until 1922. The arrival of the first radio station, PWX, was greeted with enthusiasm. PWX, owned by the Cuban Telephone Company, was located in Havana. It was a joint venture with the International Telephone and Telegraph Company of New York. PWX debuted on the air on October 10, 1922. PWX broadcast programs in both English and Spanish, and its signal was easily received at night in a number of American cities. Another early station in Cuba was owned by Frank Jones, an American amateur radio operator and chief engineer of the Tuanuku Sugar Company. The station used amateur call letters, and went on the air as 6 kW. In late 1928, PWX began using the call letters CMC. Its slogan was, If you hear La Paloma, you are in tune with CMC. As with many other countries, interest in radio expanded, and by 1932, Cuba had more than 30 stations, spread out in cities all over the island. France Radio Paris began operations in 1922, followed by Radio Toulouse and Radio Lyon. Before 1940, 14 commercial and 12 public sector radio stations were in operation. The government exerted tight control over radio broadcasting. Political debate was not encouraged. In the 1932 election campaign, for example, the opposition was allowed one broadcast while the incumbent made numerous campaign broadcasts. 
Radio was a potentially powerful new medium, but France was quite laggard in consumer ownership of radio sets, with 5 million radio receivers in 1937, compared to over 8 million in both Britain and Germany, and 26 million in the United States. The government imposed very strict controls on news dissemination. After 1938, stations were allowed only three brief daily bulletins, of seven minutes each, to cover all the day's news. The Prime Minister's office closely supervised the news items that were to be broadcast. As war approached, Frenchmen learned little or nothing about it from the radio. The government thought that policy wise, because it wanted no interference in its policies. The unexpected result, however, was the Frenchmen were puzzled and uncertain great crises erupted in 1938-39, and their morale and support for government policies was much weaker than in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Germany The first radio station in Germany went on the air in Berlin in late 1923, using the call letters. LP. Before 1933, German radio broadcasting was conducted by ten regional broadcasting monopolies, each of which had a government representative on its board. The post office provided overall supervision. A listening fee of two Reichsmark per receiver paid most costs, and radio station frequencies were limited, which even restricted the number of amateur radio operators. Immediately following Hitler's assumption of power in 1933, Joseph Goebbels became head of the Ministry for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment and took full control of broadcasting. Non-Nazis were removed from broadcasting and editorial positions. Jews were fired from all positions. Germany was easily served by a number of European medium wave stations, including the BBC, but the Nazis made it illegal for Germans to listen to foreign broadcasts. During the war, German stations broadcast not only war propaganda and entertainment for German forces dispersed through Europe, as well as air raid alerts. There was heavy use of short wave for Germany calling programs directed at Britain and Allied forces around the world. Goebbels also set up numerous Nazi stations that pretended to be from the Allied world. Germany experimented with television broadcasting, using a 180-line raster system beginning before 1935. German propaganda claimed the system was superior to the British mechanical scanning system. <laughs> Japan The first radio station in Japan was Joak, which opened in Tokyo in March 1925. It was founded by Masahiro Kotomura, an inventor and engineer. It was unique in that at least one of its announcers was a woman, Akiko Midorikawa. Joak was followed soon after by JOBK in Osaka and Jock in Nagoya. The National Broadcasting Service, today known as NHK Nippon Hoso Kyoke, began in August 1926. All stations were supported by licensing fees. In 1926, for example, people wishing to receive a permit to own a radio set paid a fee of 1 yen a month to the government. Programming on Japanese stations of the 1920s included music, news, language instruction lessons were offered in English, French and German and education's talks. These early stations broadcast on average about eight hours of programs a day. <laughs> Mexico Amateur radio was very popular in Mexico, while most of the hams were male, notably Constantino de Tarnava, acknowledged in some sources as Mexico's first amateur radio operator. One of the early ham radio operators was female Maria Dolores Estrada. But commercial radio was difficult to achieve, due to a federal regulation forbidding any broadcasts that were not for the benefit of the Mexican government. Still, in November 1923, CYL in Mexico City went on the air, featuring music both folk songs and popular dance concerts, religious services, and news. CYL used as its slogans, El Universal, and La Casa del Radio, and it won over the government, by giving political candidates the opportunity to use the station to campaign. <laughs> 
Its signal was so powerful that it was even received in Canada sometimes. Pressure from listeners and potential station owners also contributed to the government relenting and allowing more stations to go on the air. In 1931, the C call letters were all changed to X call letters Z being reserved for broadcasting, and by 1932, Mexico had nearly 40 radio stations, 10 of which were in Mexico City. Netherlands On 6 November 1919, the Dutch radio pioneer Hans Henricus Chitanus a Steringa Eidzerda started regular radio transmissions from The Hague. As these were regular transmissions and the programme was announced beforehand in the newspaper NRC, is seen as the start of commercial broadcasting. Philippines Interest in amateur radio was noted in the Philippines in the early 1920s. There were radio stations operating in the Philippines, including one owned by American businessman named Henry Herman, as early as 1922. According to some sources, not much documentation about that period of time exists. In the autumn of 1927, KZRM in Manila, owned by the Radio Corporation of the Philippines, went on the air. The Radio Corporation of the Philippines was a subsidiary of American company RCA Radio Corporation of America. By 1932, the island had three radio stations, KRZC in Cebu, as well as KZIB owned by a department store and KZFM, the government-owned station in Manila. Of the stations listed by Pierre Key, KZFM was the strongest, with 50,000 watts. Two radio networks were ultimately created, one, the Manila Broadcasting Company, began as a single station, KZRH in Manila, in July 1939, and after World War II, in 1946, the station's owners began to develop their network by buying other radio properties. As for the Philippine Broadcasting Company, it too began with one station, KZFM, and received its new name in mid-1946, after the Philippines became an independent country. At the end of 1946, the new network had six stations. Both KZRH and KZFM also affiliated with American networks, the stations wanted to have access to certain popular American programs, and the American networks wanted to sell products in the Philippines. <laughs> <laughs> Sri Lanka Sri Lanka has the oldest radio station in Asia world's second oldest. The station was known as Radio Salon. It developed into one of the finest broadcasting institutions in the world. It is now known as the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation. Sri Lanka created broadcasting history in Asia when broadcasting was started in Salon by the Telegraph Department in 1923 on an experimental footing, just three years after the inauguration of broadcasting in Europe. Gramophone music was broadcast from a tiny room in the central telegraph office with the aid of a small transmitter built by the telegraph department engineers from the radio equipment of a captured German submarine. This broadcasting experiment was successful. Barely three years later, on December 16, 1925, a regular broadcasting service came to be instituted. Edward Harper who came to Salon as chief engineer of the Telegraph Office in 1921, was the first person to actively promote broadcasting in Salon. Sri Lanka occupies an important place in the history of broadcasting with broadcasting services inaugurated just three years after the launch of the BBC in the United Kingdom. Edward Harper launched the first experimental broadcast as well as founding the Salon Wireless Club, together with British and Salonese radio enthusiasts on the island. Edward Harper has been dubbed the father of broadcasting in Salon, because of his pioneering efforts, his skill and his determination to succeed. Edward Harper and his fellow Salonese radio enthusiasts, made it happen. United Kingdom <laughs> 
The first experimental music broadcasts, from Marconi's factory in Kelmsford, began in 1920. Two years later, in October 1922, a consortium of radio manufacturers formed the British Broadcasting Company BBC. they allowed some sponsored programmes, although they were not what we would today consider a fully commercial station. Meanwhile, the first radio stations in England were Experimental Station 2MT, located near Kelmsford, and Station 2LO in London, both were operated by the Marconi Company. By late 1923, there were six stations broadcasting regularly in the United Kingdom, London's 2LO, Manchester's 2ZY, and stations in Birmingham 5IT, Cardiff, Newcastle, and Glasgow. As for the consortium of radio manufacturers, it dissolved in 1926, when its licence expired, it then became the British Broadcasting Corporation, a non-commercial organisation. Its governors are appointed by the British government, but they do not answer to it. Lord Reith took a formative role in developing the BBC, especially in radio. Working as its first manager and director general, he promoted the philosophy of public service broadcasting, firmly grounded in the moral benefits of education and of uplifting entertainment, eschewing commercial influence and maintaining a maximum of independence from political control. Commercial stations such as Radio Normandy and Radio Luxembourg broadcast into the UK from other European countries. This provided a very popular alternative to the rather austere BBC. These stations were closed during the war, and only Radio Luxembourg returned afterward. BBC television broadcasts in Britain began on November 2, 1936, and continued until wartime conditions closed the service in 1939. United States Reginald Fessenden did groundbreaking experiments with voice and music by 1906. Charles. Doc. Herald of San Jose, California sent out broadcasts as early as April 1909 from his Herald School Electronics Institute in downtown San Jose, using the identification San Jose Calling, and then a variety of different call signs as the Department of Commerce began to regulate radio. He was on the air daily for nearly a decade when the World War interrupted operations. Pioneer Radio Station 2XG, also known as the Highbridge Station was an experimental station located in New York City and licensed to the DeForest Radio Telephone and Telegraph Company. It was the first station to use a vacuum tube transmitter to make radio broadcasts on a regular schedule. From 1912 to 1917 Charles Harold made regular broadcasts, but used an ARC transmitter. He switched to a vacuum tube transmitter when he restarted broadcasting activities in 1921. Harold coined the terms broadcasting and narrowcasting. Harold claimed the invention of broadcasting to a wide audience, through the use of antennas designed to radiate signals in all directions. David Sarnoff has been considered by many as the prescient prophet of broadcasting who predicted the medium's rise in 1915 referring to his radio music box concept. A few organizations were allowed to keep working on radio during the war. Westinghouse was the most well-known of these. Frank Conrad, a Westinghouse engineer, had been making transmissions from 8XK since 1916 that included music programming. A team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison headed by Professor Earl M. Terry was also on the air. They operated 9XM, originally licensed by Professor Edward Bennett in 1914, and experimented with voice broadcasts starting in 1917. Topic: 1920s. By 1919, after the war, radio pioneers across the country resumed transmissions. The early stations gained new call signs. Many early stations were started by newspapers worried radio might replace their newspapers. 8XK became KDKA in 1920. KDKA received the first federal license and began broadcasting on November 2, 1920. Madison Avenue early on recognized the importance of radio as a new advertising medium. 
Advertising provided the major funding for most stations. The United States never had a licensing fee for set users. The National Broadcasting Company began regular broadcasting in 1926, with telephone links between New York and other eastern cities. NBC became the dominant radio network, splitting into red and blue networks. The Columbia Broadcasting System began in 1927 under the guidance of William S. Paley. Radio in education began as early as April 1922, when Medford Hillside's WGI Radio broadcast the first of an ongoing series of educational lectures from Tufts College professors. These lectures were described by the press as a sort of wireless college. Soon, other colleges across the U.S. began adding radio broadcasting courses to their curricula. Some, like the University of Iowa, even provided what today would be known as distance learning credits. Curry College, first in Boston and then in Milton, Massachusetts, introduced one of the nation's first broadcasting majors in 1932 when the college teamed up with WLOE in Boston to have students broadcast programs. This success led to numerous radio courses in the curriculum which has taught thousands of radio broadcasters from the 1930s to today. In 1934, several independent stations formed the Mutual Broadcasting System to exchange syndicated programming, including The Lone Ranger and Amos and Andy. Prior to 1927, US radio was supervised by the Department of Commerce. Then, the Radio Act of 1927 created the Federal Radio Commission In 1934, this agency became known as the Federal Communications Commission A Federal Communications Commission decision in 1939 required NBC to divest itself of its Blue Network. That decision was sustained by the Supreme Court in a 1943 decision, National Broadcasting Co. v. United States, which established the framework that the scarcity of radio frequency meant that broadcasting was subject to greater regulation than other media. This Blue Network network became the American Broadcasting Company ABC. Around 1946, ABC, NBC, and CBS began regular television broadcasts. Another TV network, the Dumont Television Network, was founded earlier, but was disbanded in 1956. Later in 1986, the surviving Dumont Independent Stations formed the nucleus of the new Fox Broadcasting Company. Topic: 1950s and 1960s. Australia Norman Banks was one of Melbourne's and Australia's most prominent broadcasters at 3KZ and 3AW He is remembered for founding Carols by Candlelight, as a pioneer football commentator, and for hosting both musical and interview programmes. In later years he was one of Melbourne's first and most prominent talk-back hosts. At the commencement of his career, Banks was known for his double entendres and risque remarks. As a talk-back host he was outspoken in his conservative views, especially regarding the white Australia policy and apartheid. In 1978 his 47-year career in radio was hailed as the longest in world history. Not including the early television experiments see above, mainstream television transmission commenced in Sydney and Melbourne in the latter part of 1956, that is, in time for the 1956 Melbourne Olympic Games in November, December 1956. It was then phased into other capital cities, and then into rural markets. Many forms entertainment, particularly drama and variety, were considered more suited to television than radio, and many such programs were gradually deleted from radio schedules. The transistor radio first appeared on the market in 1954. In particular, it made portable radios even more transportable. All sets quickly became smaller, cheaper and more convenient. The aim of radio manufacturers became a radio in every room, in the car, and in the pocket. The upshot of these two changes was that stations started to specialize and concentrate on specific markets. 
The first areas to see specialized stations were the news and current affairs market, and stations specializing in pop music and geared toward the younger listener who was now able to afford his, her own radio. Talk back. Talk radio became a major radio genre by the end of the 1960s, but it was not legalized in Australia until October 1967. The fears of intrusion were addressed by a beep that occurred every few seconds, so that the caller knew that his, her call was being broadcast. There was also a seven-second delay so that obscene or libelous material could be monitored. By the end of the 1960s, specialization by radio stations had increased dramatically and there were stations focusing on various kinds of music, talkback, news, sport, etc. Germany When the Federal Republic of Germany was organized in 1949, its enabling act established strong state government powers. Broadcasting was organized on a state, rather than a national, basis. Nine regional radio networks were established. A technical coordinating organization, the Arbeitsgemeinschaft der Öffentlich Rechtlichen Rundfunkanstalten der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, ARD, came into being in 1950 to lessen technical conflicts. The Allied forces in Europe developed their own radio networks, including the U.S. American Forces Network (AFN). Inside Berlin, radio in the American sector Rias became a key source of news in the German Democratic Republic. Germany began developing a network of VHF FM broadcast stations in 1955 because of the excessive crowding of the medium wave and shortwave broadcast bands. 1933 Sri Lanka Radio Salon ruled the airwaves in the 1950s and 1960s in the Indian subcontinent. The station developed into the most popular radio network in South Asia. Millions of listeners in India for example tuned into Radio Salon. Announcers like Livy Widjaman, Vernon Correa, Pearl Ondatya, Tim Horshington, Greg Ruskowski, Jimmy Barucha, Mil Sansoni, Eardley Pires, Shirley Pereira, Bob Harvey, Christopher Greet, Prosper Fernando, Amin Sayani of Banaka Gitmala fame, Karunaratne Abesekara, S. P. Mylvayaganam the first Tamil announcer on the commercial service were hugely popular across South Asia. The Hindi service also helped build Radio Salon's reputation as the market leader in the Indian subcontinent. Gopal Sharma, Sunil Dutt Amin Sayani, Hamid Sayani, were among the Indian announcers of the station. The commercial service of Radio Salon was hugely successful under the leadership of Clifford Dodd, the Australian administrator and broadcasting expert who was sent to Salon under the Colombo Plan. Dodd Hand picked some of the most talented radio presenters in South Asia. They went on to enjoy star status in the Indian subcontinent. This was Radio Salon's golden era. <laughs> <laughs> United Kingdom Radio Luxembourg remained popular during the 1950s but saw its audience decline as commercial television and pirate radio, combined with a switch to a less clear frequency, began to erode its influence. BBC television resumed on June 7, 1946, and commercial television began on September 22, 1955. Both used the pre-war 405-line standard. BBC Two came on the air on April 20, 1964, using the 625-line standard, and began PAL color transmissions on July 1, 1967, the first in Europe. The two older networks transmitted in 625-line color from 1969. During the 1960s there was still no UK-based commercial radio. A number of pirate radio ships, located in international waters just outside the jurisdiction of English law, came on the air between 1964 and 1967. The most famous of these was Radio Caroline, which was the only station to continue broadcasting after the offshore pirates were effectively outlawed on August 14, 1967 by the Marine Broadcasting Offences Act. <laughs> 
It was finally forced off air due to a dispute over tendering payments, but returned in 1972 and continued on and off until 1990. The station subsequently broadcast legally, initially under 28-day restricted service licenses and subsequently via satellite, since closed, internet streams and, since 2017, a local AM transmitter. United States Television began to replace radio as the chief source of revenue for broadcasting networks. Although many radio programs continued through this decade, including Gunsmoke and The Guiding Light, by 1960 networks had ceased producing entertainment programs. As radio stopped producing formal 15-minute to hourly programs, a new format developed. Top 40 was based on a continuous rotation of short pop songs presented by a disc jockey. Famous disc jockeys in the era included Alan Freed, Dick Clark, Don Imus and Wolfman Jack. Top 40 playlists were theoretically based on record sales, however, record companies began to bribe disc jockeys to play selected artists, in a controversy that was called, Payola. In the 1950s, American television networks introduced broadcasts in color. The Federal Communications Commission approved the world's first monochrome-compatible color television standard in December 1953. The first network colorcast followed on January 1, 1954, with NBC transmitting the annual Tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena, California to over 20 stations across the country. An educational television network, National Educational Television Net, predecessor to PBS, was founded. Shortwave broadcasting played an important part of fighting the Cold War with Voice of America and the BBC World Service, Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty transmitting through the Iron Curtain, and Radio Moscow and others broadcasting back, as well as jamming. Transmitting to cause intentional interference the Western stations in the Soviet bloc. Topic 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. Topic Australia After much procrastination on the part of various federal governments, FM broadcasting was eventually introduced in 1975. There had been official experiments with FM broadcasting as far back as 1948. Only a handful of radio stations were given new licenses during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, but, since 1975, many hundreds of new broadcasting licenses have been issued on both the FM and AM bands. In the latter case, this was made possible by having 9 kHz between stations, rather 10 kHz breaks, as per the Geneva Frequency Plan. The installation of directional aerials also encouraged more AM stations. The type of station given FM licenses reflects the policies and philosophies of the various Australian governments. Initially, only the ABC and community radio stations were granted FM licenses. However, after a change of government, commercial stations were permitted on the band, as from 1980. At first, one or two brand new stations were permitted in each major market. However, in 1990, one or two existing AM stations in each major market were given FM licenses, the stations being chosen by an auction system. Apart from an initial settling in period for those few stations transferred from AM to FM, there has been no simulcasting between AM and FM stations. In major cities, a number of brand new FM licenses were issued in the 1990s and 2000s. All rural regions which traditionally had only one commercial station now have at least one AM and one FM commercial station. In many cases, the owner of the original station now has at least two outlets. The number of regional transmitters for the ABC's five networks also increased dramatically during this era. <laughs> Europe Commercial radio legalization in most European countries occurred in this era, starting with United Kingdom in 1973 see independent local radio and ending with Austria in 1995. 
In 1987, stations in the European Broadcasting Union began offering Radio Data System RDS, which provides written text information about programs that were being broadcast, as well as traffic alerts, accurate time, and other teletext services. Topic: <laughs> Sri Lanka The government of Sri Lanka opened up the market in the late 1970s and 1980s allowing private companies to set up radio and television stations. Sri Lanka's public services broadcasters are the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation Independent Television Network and the affiliated radio station called Lakhanda. They had stiff competition on their hands with the private sector. Broadcasting in Sri Lanka went through a transformation resulting in private broadcasting institutions being set up on the island among them Telshan Network Private Limited TNL, Maharaja Television, TV, Sarasa TV and Shakti TV, and EAP Network Private Limited, known as Swarnawahini. These private channels all have radio stations as well. The 1990s saw a new generation of radio stations being established in Sri Lanka among them the Hiru radio station. In the 1980s public service broadcasters like the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation set up their own FM arm. Sri Lanka celebrated 80 years of broadcasting in December 2005. In January 2007 the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation celebrated 40 years as a public corporation. Topic. United Kingdom A new pirate station, Swiss-owned Radio Nord Sea International, broadcast to Britain and the Netherlands from 1970 until outlawed by Dutch legislation in 1974 which meant it could no longer be supplied from the European mainland. The English service was heavily jammed by both Labour and Conservative governments in 1970 amid suggestions that the ship was actually being used for espionage. Radio Caroline returned in 1972 and continued until its ship sank in 1980 the crew were rescued. A Belgian station, Radio Atlantis, operated an English service for a few months before the Dutch Act came into force in 1974. Land-based commercial radio finally came on air in 1973 with London's LBC and Capital Radio. Channel 4 television started in November 1982. Britain's UHF system was originally designed to carry only four networks. Pirate Radio enjoyed another brief resurgence with a literal relaunch of Radio Caroline in 1983, and the arrival of American-owned Laser 558 in 1985. Both stations were harassed by the British authorities. Laser closed in 1987 and Caroline in 1989. Since then, it has pursued legal methods of broadcasting, such as temporary FM licenses and satellite. Two rival satellite television systems came on the air at the end of the 1980s Sky Television and British Satellite Broadcasting. Huge losses forced a rapid merger, although in many respects it was a takeover of BSB Britain's official, government-sanctioned satellite company by Sky. Radio Luxembourg launched a 24-hour English channel on satellite, but closed its AM service in 1989 and its satellite service in 1991. The Broadcasting Act 1990 in UK law marked the establishment of two licensing authorities, the Radio Authority and the Independent Television Commission, to facilitate the licensing of non-BBC broadcast services, especially short-term broadcasts. Channel 5 went on the air on March 30, 1997, using «spare» frequencies between the existing channels. United States The rise of FM changed the listening habits of younger Americans. Many stations such as WNEW-FM in New York City began to play whole sides of record albums, as opposed to the «Top 40» model of two decades earlier. In the 1980s, the Federal Communications Commission, under Reagan administration and congressional pressure, changed the rules limiting the number of radio and television stations a business entity could own in one metropolitan area. 
This deregulation led to several groups, such as Infinity Broadcasting and Clear Channel to buy many stations in major cities. The cost of these stations' purchases led to a conservative approach to broadcasting, including limited playlists and avoiding controversial subjects to not offend listeners, and increased commercials to increase revenue. AM radio declined throughout the 1970s and 1980s due to various reasons including, lower cost of FM receivers, narrow AM audio bandwidth, and poor sound in the AM section of automobile receivers to combat the crowding of stations in the AM band and a loudness war conducted by AM broadcasters, and increased radio noise in homes caused by fluorescent lighting and introduction of electronic devices in homes. AM radio's decline flattened out in the mid-1990s due to the introduction of niche formats and over-commercialization of many FM stations. The 2000s The 2000s saw the introduction of digital radio and direct broadcasting by satellite DBS in the USA. Digital radio services, except in the United States, were allocated a new frequency band in the range of 1,400 MHz. Regular shortwave broadcasts using Digital Radio Mondiale DRM, a digital broadcasting scheme for short and medium wave broadcasts have begun. This system makes the normally scratchy international broadcasts clear and nearly FM quality, and much lower transmitter power. This is much better to listen to and has more languages. Topic: Australia. In Australia, from August 2009, digital radio was phased in by geographical region. Today, the ABC, SBS, commercial and community radio stations operate on the AM and FM bands. Most stations are available on the internet and most also have digital outlets. By 2007, there were 261 commercial stations in Australia. The ABC currently has 5 AM, FM networks and is in the process of establishing a series of supplementary music stations that are only available on digital radios and digital television sets. SBS provides non-English language programs over its two networks, as do a number of community radio stations. Canada In Canada, the Canadian Radio Television and Telecommunications Commission plans to move all Canadian broadcasting to the digital band and close all medium wave and FM stations. Europe European stations have begun digital broadcasting DAB. Digital radios began to be sold in the United Kingdom in 1998. Sri Lanka In Sri Lanka in 2005 when Sri Lanka celebrated 80 years in broadcasting, the former Director General of the Sri Lanka Broadcasting Corporation, Eric Fernando called for the station to take full advantage of the digital age, this included looking at the archives of Radio Salon. Ivan Korea asked the President of Sri Lanka, Mahinda Rajapaksi to invest in the future of the SLBC. United States In the United States, this band was deemed to be vital to national defense, so an alternate band in the range of 2,300 MHz was introduced for satellite broadcasting. Two American companies, XM and Sirius, introduced DBS systems, which are funded by direct subscription, as in cable television. The XM and Sirius systems provide approximately 100 channels each, in exchange for monthly payments. In addition, a consortium of companies received FCC approval for in-band on-channel digital broadcasts in the United States, which use the existing medium wave and FM bands to provide CD-quality sound. However, early IBOC tests showed interference problems with adjacent channels, which has slowed adoption of the system. <laughs> 
Topic See also Oldest radio station Oldest television station Birth of public radio broadcasting Women in early radio History of advertising History of radio Timeline of radio Timeline of the introduction of radio in countries Radio broadcasting History of telecommunication History of television <laughs>